That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Vortex, the sixth film directed by Gaspar Noé. I'm not counting his medium-length film Lux Eterna from 2019, which is also about to be released, finally. Uh, premiered at the 2021 Cannes Film Festival in their newly anointed premiere section. Uh, and Utopia is releasing it April 29th, 2022. This is the second time I've seen this film. The first time, I don't know why Cannes always does this, well, his last three films now, to Gaspar Noé. Plays this shit at midnight. This started an hour late. The movie's two and a half hours long. I was so exhausted the first time I watched this film. The, like, it, well, this is not a film. To, you know, I don't know what to say. Um, this is the type of film I could talk about for hours. So in that regard, I think a job very well done. But it's a hard thing to sit through. I don't know when would be a good... It, it's not a Sunday afternoon light viewing. It's not a Friday date night movie. It's not a Wednesday after work movie. I don't know when you would watch this and not feel traumatized. <laughs> I, you know, it, it is far removed from what you would expect from Gaspar Noé. Uh, the only film of theirs I know is... You know Climax. Climax, which I did enjoy. I actually would watch again. Climax, is, I think that might have been my favorite release that year, but I've liked all of his films. I Stand Alone, uh, Irreversible has, of course, that very infamous nine-minute rape scene of Monica Bellucci, uh, and their uh, Enter the Void, I think, is probably my favorite film of his, which uh, competed at Cannes uh, as a rough cut, and everybody uh, lambasted that movie, but I really uh, love that film. Uh, his 2015 film, Love, the 3D sex movie was whatever. Uh, I do recommend Lux Eterna. It's a 51-minute film starring Charlotte Gainsbourg and Beatrice Dahl. You should flash that poster art because I love it. Um, this is very much something that's in a kind of collusion with Michael Haneke's Amour. And I think this is actually the better, heavier, harder-hitting film. And I know you didn't see that. but The basic story. It focuses on a couple... Mm -hmm. who are in their 80s, married for a very long time. And it's a snapshot of their lives towards the end of their lives, spoiler alert, um, as the wife is dealing with senility. So she's a psychiatrist by trade, so she can prescribe medication. And their cluttered-ass apartment is filled with drugs that she's taking, so it's not quite clear if she's, because she's sort of out of it and doesn't communicate well, seems to not remember anything. So what percentage of that is like dementia versus she's just hopped up on these drugs. And then her husband uh, is much more lucid and is working on a novel. He's clearly very much into books and film. He has lots of books and DVD movies in his house. Lots we of beautiful poster art. Lots of posters. Gaspar Noé has in all of his films. And we find out that he has been managing a 20-year-long love affair with a woman... Named Claire. Named Claire. That's now starting to ignore his calls. So we see that the husband is sort of frustrated with his wife. Um, the opening of the film is them like a, like a day in the life of. She wakes up, gets ready, and leaves the house and wanders off. And when he realizes she's gone, he's, he freaks out and runs all over their little town looking for her, finds her, reprimands her, but it seems like it's for naught. When we find out they have a son, he calls the son over, and this son has serious issues with uh, substance abuse. He's in recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, well, to the, I mean, it's not just like he's an addict. I mean, to the point where, like, he has a court-ordered social worker. He has a child who he doesn't have full custody of. Kiki. He has money issues. So he's in no position to assist his parents, but he's trying, bless his heart. And it's it sort of culminates somewhat with the son recommending that his parents move into an assisted care facility. But the dad's like, absolutely not. I'm not leaving all my shit. But it's like, so you don't care about your wife who's falling apart. But the gag is the husband dies first. Mm -hmm. From complications of a stroke. Mm -hmm. But then everything deteriorates from there. Very quickly. It is the vortex of the title. Because the son has a relapse, so now he's of no use. A social worker is sort of in charge of managing the wife's care, but she's just in this, their apartment, like comatose. One day, the social worker comes and she's laid out on the floor. And then we see her body in a morgue. So mm -hmm. she has died. And then there's a funeral. The end. Mm -hmm. And I really like the end because there are all these snapshots of uh, the their apartment as it's slowly being emptied and things are being boxed up. 
I could talk about this movie for we already talked about it a lot. We did, we um, have, yes. It's depressing as hell, but very relatable to anyone, whether you're in a relationship, we're all aging. We all perhaps have parents we have to deal with who are aging. Or grandparents. Yeah. Or I mean, th there's just so much that we can relate to ab about happiness and love and career because uh, where to begin? Well, so the couple is played by Dario Argento the uh, Italian horror filmmaker who you've seen his Suspiria, I know, several times. Uh, many, many other films that he's directed. So, I mean, it's very interesting to see him front and center. He does a fine job. Yes. Um, but really, uh, the... Uh, wife. The wife, played by Francoise Lebrun, uh, is the... Uh, kind of the heavy hitter here, I think. And she... Her it, performance is excellent. It's great. She's probably best known for um, this film called The Mother and the Whore, which is pretty good from the 70s, which is why Gaspar Noé liked her. But she has worked with um, Paul Vecchiali and Guillaume Niclo, cast her quite a bit. Uh, she's in an Arnaud de, de Plechon film, My Golden Years, which is pretty good. Marguerite Dura cast her a couple times in the 70s. So she's she's been around. I also like The Son. I thought uh, he was handsome too. Who's uh, that? Stefan, uh, played by Alex Lutz. Uh, I'm not as familiar with his filmography. To me, he was giving me a young Klaus Kinski vibe. Okay. Uh, but yeah, he's very good too. Much like that Isabelle Huppert role in Amour with the child dealing with the parents. Can we just go through my notes? Mm -hmm. um, the film plays all of the credits in the opening. Backwards. Which I don't like. To me, that's like making me pay and tip for my meal before I get it. Sure. But what if I don't like it? And then also, usually when I like a film, then I want to go through the credits and see like, ooh, who did the cinematography? Ooh, mm -hmm. what was that song? Ooh, who played this waiter in the... So. But Gaspar Noy does that all the time. In fact, in Climax, the credits happen in the middle of the film. Mm-hmm. You know, it's something different. It's not a problem. I just, you know, because I didn't know anything about this movie and I didn't want to watch it. Like, I was very against watching it. Um, then I was just immediately annoyed by the credits. But you get the dedication uh, in the beginning too. It's to all those whose brains will decompose before their hearts. That really spoke to me. Well, so many things this movie spoke to me, which I don't want to get into because it's just going to be heavy. But um, yeah, I would say this movie's excellent mm -hmm. because it just left me like it's like an emotional reaction. And so much to think and talk about, which is really the function of art. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, it's such a such a well done story, but it's so simple. It, and then you were telling me that the director was asked about how this is such a less violent film than, or it's less violent than what less he's known. violent and provocative. Yeah. But but I would argue that you know I've only seen the one, but I've seen a lot of heavy violent shit, and that you know that doesn't strike me as hard as something like this because it's just so sobering. Mm -hmm. and honestly just depressing yes for sure and I like his use of um, the repeated Edgar Allan Poe line about life is nothing but a dream within a dream in the beginning of the film we hear I don't know if it's a radio broadcast or a TV broadcast but we hear someone it, there, there, there's like a segment talking about death and grieving mm -hmm. and then it moves into the topic of memory mm -hmm. i thought that was really effective yes uh i really like that too about how we're constantly reorganizing our memories and that that is uh, necessary as we move forward and talking about how uh you know memories of childhood when we're a teenager are much different than you know when we're middle-aged etc um and about how traumatic memory is is trapped where it's not moving because you're trapped in that memory i really like that he uh the Argento character is writing, he t says many times, uh, a book about um, symbolism and dreams. We don't really get to know much more about it, but it's called Psyche. I'll, but we're I'll, not supposed to. We're not supposed to. But like he's getting nowhere. Because he's also stuck. He's, yeah. he's stuck somewhere. And the trauma is that maybe he's never been able to accomplish what he can. And of course, her uh, mental progress is halted by something else. I'm, I was triggered by many things in this movie, but one of them was the clutter everywhere. <laughs> like... I don't like clutter. I feel like it inhibits like prog progress sometimes. Joseph is very much like Joan Crawford in Mommy Dearest. <laughs> it's not you, it's the dirt. But I appreciate like there are things that are symbols that bring joy, but I think mm -hmm. a lot of times people hold like I think like you hold on to things just because you don't want to get rid of them and they have meaning to you, but we're not going to get into that except that it was just so hard to watch this cluttered ass apartment with this man obsessed with his things and then at the point where the son says 
you should move into this assisted care facility. I found a great spot. They almost always never have a spot for two people and they have. So this is a great opportunity. And I can really relate to this with my own mother of like, you know, not wanting to do what makes the most sense. And he says, no, if I move, I have to get rid of my things. I'm not doing that. And it, like, it, it's clear that he, and I find it interesting that Noe took the time to, uh, as one of the tangents of the plots, he has this love, this other love interest that he would go traveling with that clearly the wife knows about because the son references this woman as well, uh, which I found interesting. But it's clear that he is annoyed at kind of his wife's um, devolvement because uh, when he has to go fetch her in the beginning, he chastises her when they get back in the apartment. He's like, I'm trying to write, for God's sake. Well, I think <laughs> another thing that really spoke to me is like, as a married couple, like they, they built this life together and they have a very full life. Like she had a very respectable, I'm sure very uh, substantial career as a psychiatrist. He is clearly very involved in cinema and literature and his career hasn't really taken him anywhere it would seem. Whereas his wife, I'm assuming, kept the household together. Mm -hmm. So just sort of understanding that like they stayed married for so long and like the husband had this decades long affair that he is like emotionally invested in this woman, like calling her, begging her to like be with him while your fucking wife is, I, I don't know. I just think like sometimes people don't know how to make concessions. Like it's not always about you. Like maybe at a point. But then when you decide to stay with someone that long, it's like, you need to give all that up. That shit has to die, okay? Because now, because I feel like a lot of people don't think about what life will be like down the road. Mm -hmm. Like when we're old and gray and we really do need each other. Like that selfishness needs to go away. And this man, like that just never. And then because we don't know the wife's feelings because she's out of it. Mm -hmm. Which I think is very... Uh, effective because like i was saying earlier today it's almost like watching it i want to pick a side mm -hmm. like who's right and who's wrong because really like it's so easy to shit on the husband but then it's like well we don't know how the wife treated him and he had to find his own happiness and maybe he found that in this woman claire and then maybe at a point he decided i'll stay with her because she needs me but i need to do what i need to do right like we don't know why he but then we also don't know what the wife did for him and so Yes. It's very effective in leaving me feeling like I want more. Like, I need to understand more. But that's not how life works, right? Like, you can invest all of your life into something or someone. And then you just... Life sucks and you die. And it's just like, it is what it is. <laughs> that's how I felt about it. Interestingly, your thought about picking a side it, it relates to how it's shot as well. Uh, because oh, yes. very early on... And it was shot by uh, one of my favorite... Uh, contemporary cinematographer is Benoit Debye. This is an important feature, yeah. Uh, Debye also shot Climax. Uh, he's done all kinds of things, including the Rihanna music video, Bitch Better Have My Money. Uh, very, very talented cinematographer. But he, the um, visual process of the film is they're all in one frame, and then uh, as they're lying in bed early on, there's this thick black line that slowly goes down the middle. The, of the film screen. is shot in two shots, and so it's split screen. It's split screen, but it becomes split screen at this significant moment where very early on where we're meant to say like they are now moving apart so we watched the majority like 99 percent of the film is watching it with the, the husband and wife on the same on the same screen but two different shots and what each of them is doing individually which is interesting because then you get kind of two perspectives of the same person in, in some shots yes that's well. right yeah i like i'm i know i've seen movies that use a similar feature device but i in the ones I've seen that I can recall, it was very gimmicky and ineffective. The one that I, was I think this story is like the perfect story to tell in this fashion. The one that always comes to mind is the Mike Figgis film Time Code, which came out in the year 2000, which I remember oh. thinking didn't work. So there, there's a lot of talk of prescription drugs in this movie, which is interesting. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm struggling to sort of understand why it's so prominent. I mean, there's a lot of talk about the drugs. Because the wife is a psychiatrist and she, we, we know that she is actively prescribing drugs for herself, trying to get drugs for her husband. I don't, that point of the story is a little lost on me why there's so much emphasis on that. Well, there's a, maybe is a juxtaposition between the kind of drugs the parents are taking versus the child. 
Oh, sure. Or because he's, how he's a, how the husband's fixated on his books and his movies, and she's fixated on maybe because you know the reality is she wasn't always this bad. And maybe when she started to notice that her memory was a little mm. fuzzy, maybe she became obsessed with trying to treat herself, which is probably not a good idea because the son does say... Well, the son looks at some of those, he's like, this is really strong. <laughs> and then the dad's like, well, her psychiatrist prescribed it and the son doesn't believe that because he knows his mom can get her own drugs. So, you know, it's a very heavy point that's made. Then we also get but the... But we, we see him towards the end when he relapses freebasing in front of Kiki, the kid. Ugh. Then there are a couple moments where it's unclear whether she was trying to kill her husband. One moment is she leaves the gas on with the windows closed and the husband is in the other, like his office and he smells it and freaks out and she's just there like, well, I don't know. Then we see her at one point mixing up like a drug cocktail that would knock out a horse, I'm presuming. Mm -hmm. But then we never see anyone take it. There's another scene that I like where she's kind of in a free fall, but she destroys all his notes. She that cleans, was also she, triggering. She, clean, she cleans up his desk. And that was also triggering to me, just like being in a relationship with someone who it feels like sometimes they care more about their things than me. And like, but at the same time, it was like, I would never, like knowing that they're important to this person, like how angry would I have to be to like burn your books? Or, you know what I mean? Like it would just have to be like, so clearly she was not in her right mind. Because even in my most, like, upset, I wouldn't think, like, I want to destroy the things someone cares about. Like, so I thought that was a very powerful symbol. That she was really out of her mind mm -hmm. to do that. She was out of because her Because she lived in that nightmare of an apartment with all that shit in it, like I've done. And, like, didn't do anything about it. So clearly had reconciled Our that. house has never looked like that. Plus, please don't burn my books. My father used to do that to me. <laughs> I'm saying that she would have to be out of her mind. So... I think the symbolism of her, because she doesn't burn all his shit or do anything. She just takes everything that's on his desk, including the manuscript to this book he's been it's working It's clear on. that the, the most important things. <laughs> well, he, <laughs> but he has she, thousands and thousands of books. But then she flushes them down the toilet. And then she tears them up in little pieces and throws them in the toilet. In front of him. But it's really more symbolic because he typed that on a computer, so I'm sure he can no, just No, he's got a typewriter. Oh, well, sure, but... I found that interesting, too, towards the beginning. They showed that she has a laptop and he uses a typewriter mm. primarily. Um... Which is interesting about where they are stuck in different. Well, I like eras. that they have also like the roles or, you know, tr on a traditional sort of uh, front reversed. Like, she appears to be the more successful one who kept the household together, and he was like living a pipe dream, maybe. Mm -hmm. But again, we don't know the full story. But I'm okay with that. To me, the the hardest hitting scene was when she's still lucid and that's where the son proposes they move into this assisted living facility and the, Dario Argento is just mad because he doesn't want to give away any of his stuff and all their memories are in this house and she, she just keeps saying that she wants to die and I wish you guys could be rid of me. <laughs> and the way they comfort her is not very comforting. No, but uh, you know, again, I could talk about this for hours, but I really related to so many things, both characters, just... Also, the son feeling like, I don't know what to do, which I, I don't want to go on a rant, but I, yeah. I had a pretty heavy discussion with someone recently about having children at an older age. Mm -hmm. And a big rationale for why I think sometimes maybe it's not the best, like, you know, even like a Janet Jackson having a kid at 50 is like, okay, so when your kid graduates college, I'm assuming little Issa's going to college, she'll be 72. And it's like, that's like right when a young adult is like starting their life, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what am I going to do next? Am I going to grad school, starting my career, start a business? And I have to worry about my senior citizen ass mom. It just feels, even, even at high school age, like when that kid graduates high school, his mom is going to be a senior citizen. Mm -hmm. And I just think like a 26 year old, a 29 year old is not equipped to deal with the reality of like taking care of elderly parents. And then I felt that watching, I feel very fortunate that my mom had me quite young and so did yours. So, you know, at the point where they would need assistance, we would be very well equipped to do that. But watching the son in this movie just be like, like my hands are tied. Like I can't do any more for you. Like I can't, he says, I can't even help myself. Mm -hmm. That really made me emotional because it's just like, I because I'm not a parent and I'm 43 so at this point I think I'm too old to have like a newborn kid for that reason also I don't want kids but 
I, if I did, I would probably not because I just think like, yeah, I don't want my like, you know, 30 year old kid to have to think like, how do I take care of myself and my parents? Mm -hmm. That part of it really hit me that that responsibility is something that even being born, I often think like I wasn't asked to be here. And then <laughs> it's like, I have to deal with all this shit. And oftentimes life is not forgiving and we all have to move on and blah, blah, blah. Um, I thought it was uh, the very final shot of the film is a picture of Dario Argento and Francoise Lebrun mm. as, as young people and it has their birth, their real birth year and the date of death is 2020, which is very... It's sobering. Sobering because, you know, they're both... Those uh, actors are old. <laughs> those actors are old in their 80s and said, you know, even having to go... Even when I thought of uh, Emmanuel Rivas, who's now dead, and Jean-Louis Trintignant doing a Moor, it's like, you're doing something that you are... This is very close to home. Well, or Anthony Hopkins in The Father. In The Father, yes. And then watching him at the most recent Academy Awards, like, you know. Because yeah, somebody, I just saw a headline with Jane Fonda saying, like, who's, I'm not, I'm close to death age-wise and I'm not scared of it. And it's like, wow, yeah, yeah. like, that's a very stark, the stark reality. We'll have to have an episode on the podcast about death. Do you have anything else to say? No. What would you give it? Four out of five. I would give it four out of five as well. Listen to our podcast. Bye. Thank you.